So what is freedom to you? What does it mean to be free? And what does that look like when you think, I'm free, or free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. What does it mean? Or or better yet, if you truly felt free, what would you do different? God initiates this relationship that we have with the divine maker of all that is, the one who holds us in those holy and omniscient, omnipresent, omnitemporal hands. And that's good news because it's God who does the choosing, and God chooses all of us. That's what our epistle lesson tells us this morning. And the choice doesn't take away our agency or our participation in the process. Doesn't mean that we're predestined. This initiative reflects God's original agency before we had the opportunity to say yes or no. God chooses, but then doesn't make the choice for us. We are free. And when we say yes to God, we can find a new kind of freedom in Christ. And and this isn't the same kind of freedom that people talk about in political science or rationalists or the, the kind of freedom that we celebrated last week on Independence Day. This isn't John Locke's freedom to enjoy persons or properties as one sees fit. Our freedom in Christ means making Jesus the master of our lives. And that might seem to be a little bit of a conflict, being free to make Jesus the master of our lives. Our self-surrender to Christ shows up more powerfully in poetry than in reason. Like the opening line of Gerard Manley Hopkins' epic poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland, Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, make world's strand, sway of sea, Lord of living and dead. That idea, thou mastering me, it's a statement of faith. It's a statement of a journey. It's a statement of our own participation in God. Ephesians 1 gives an account of of this kind of spiritual freedom. And it's the spiritual blessings of being in Christ. These verses spell everything out, and they're a bit cumbersome because Ephesians falls into this uh, Deuteropauline type of literature. We're blessed through Christ, if you kind of break it down into the kernel of its message. God chose us, redeemed us, and pours out spiritual blessings upon us. The passage then shows God's universal love and a desire to have a relationship with everybody. Verse 5, God destined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. And this doesn't mean that God picked some and not others or excluded others. God picked everybody. But not everybody picks God. Verse 13, we see this idea explicitly spelled out. When when you heard the word of truth, when, when you believed in God, you were marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And this is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's people in hearing, believing, and acting. We can see freedom in relation to God. Ephesians can be challenging for a number of reasons, but these sentences just seem to go on and on. If you're listening to Rob read the passage and you're trying to follow it, but it it seemed like there was a missing clause, or uh, it should have had, like if you were reading it and thinking to yourself, my English teacher would have had a field day with this. Awkward, awkward, run-on sentence. Not that I've ever had those comments written in the margin of a paper. In our English translation, the New Revised Standard Version has these 11 verses broken into six sentences. But in the Greek, it's all one sentence. It's all one thought. Marcus Bart describes this passage as one 
infinitely long, heavy, and clumsy sentence, replete with dependent clauses, excursus, specifications, repetitions, and the like. See, the thing is, that style fit with ancient Greek rhetoric. So, for us, instead of getting tripped up over this language or trying to parse all the clauses and figure out what's dependent, what's specifying something else, we can take the message of being free in Christ and apply it to the way we live, what we experience. This doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we want. That's Hobbes and Locke. Freedom in Christ is the kind of freedom that draws us closer to God. Being close to God is the basis for why we're here right now. It's why we exist as a church. It's why we're a family of faith. All of the other things we do, everything stems from our adoption into this divine family. Everything. When we gather for meals, so table fellowship is wonderful. Jesus enjoyed table fellowship. As a matter of fact, in Luke, it didn't seem like he cared who he ate with as long as he was eating with somebody. So we're following along this divine path when we gather for table fellowship, but that's not why we exist. The listening sessions will help us get to know where we're going and what God is calling us to do, but that's not why we exist. It all comes out of being close to God manifest here in worship. One commentator described this passage in Ephesians, chapter 1, as a theology of worship. This outlines four spiritual blessings, this, our passage. We're chosen, redeemed, living in a mystery, and recipients of a spiritual inheritance. Chosen, redeemed, living in a mystery, and recipients of a spiritual inheritance. First, we're set apart and chosen. This is verses 4 to 6. And this is where God is taking the initiative. I want you. Like the old posters during World War II, Uncle Sam wants you. Yet yeah, God says that but to all of humanity and says that with unconditional love. Not only does God say, I want you, but God's saying, I chose you and I want you to be a part of my family. Th that second part, being redeemed, provides assurance beyond this life. It's also part of a Trinitarian formula that weaves its way through this passage. In the first part, we see Jesus as, the, or I'm sorry, we see God as taking the initiative. God of the triune Godhead. The second part of this Trinitarian formula that is weaving through these verses shows the work of Christ. Now, in the third part, living in Christ draws us into a divine mystery. Our journey doesn't lead to definitive answers. And on our journey, we, we might gain some insight, might get a little bit of understanding of this ministry, but this spiritual blessing is a little bit nebulous because we're talking about a divine mystery that runs counter to the way the world looks at ideas. We're looking for understanding. We want to know why things happen the way they do. Why is this happening in my life? Why is it happening to you? There's an undercurrent of this divine mystery that's always happening. And that's why I talk about a journey of faith. We continue walking in this mystery, in faith, that God walks with us. The fourth of these spiritual blessings in this passage is God giving us a spiritual inheritance. This inheritance is the final part of the Trinitarian formula also because the Holy Spirit is the one who sets the seal of this inheritance. But the leap from spiritual blessings to concrete living can be a challenge because we use in this passage and in our faith journey some of the same language we use in daily living or in concrete living. 
But those words have a little bit different connotation. For example, when I said the word inheritance, some of you might have been thinking about the reading of a will, something going through probate, or even an experience that you had with an inheritance. Valuation, trying to figure out what it's all worth. But the inheritance in Ephesians is one that comes from freedom in Christ. It's the inheritance that you and I are not bound to worldly definitions, including worldly definitions of success or wealth. Our spiritual inheritance, sealed by the Holy Spirit, leads us to transformation. See, it's, we're struggling with a lot of the same words that we use to describe decidedly secular situations, but we're applying them in the way that we relate to God. And that's why that second blessing, the divine mystery, is so important and appropriate. It comes up again and again as we struggle to understand. Our freedom in Christ transcends human limitations. People are always trying to figure one another out. You know, put a label on somebody. If we can get somebody into a box, we can understand them, right? Uh, you, you say, oh, that person's from this place, and you think, I, I know a little bit more. Or you hear an accent, and you make an assumption. We like to assess one another and, and figure out this kind of background. But divine freedom changes the parameters of how we see the world. We are chosen, redeemed, living in this mystery and, and recipients of a, a spiritual inheritance. Our relationship with God makes attempts to peg us to something in the world, nothing more than a caricature. When we read Ephesians 1, we don't read it alone. The author of this passage doesn't write just to you. This letter, whatever the origins, wherever it came from, wherever it first started, wasn't to a person. The pronouns throughout the reading, even in the English, when we heard Rob reading it a few minutes ago, are all plural. This is to all of us. God blessed us, chose us, destined us. Not only can we not be pegged by worldly definitions, but we're in this together. Our banner is Christ and our calling is transformation. Being in Christ is the central theme of this passage. And following Christ means emptying ourselves, and this is where our freedom comes together with surrender. We accomplish this by setting our egos aside and surrendering to God. And that, that's what Hopkins meant by thou mastering me. It, it's a bit of a choice. I am making you master of me. We put ourselves aside and let Christ be the master of our lives. And that's really, really hard. I, I hope that you were already thinking that. Great, you can say it. <laughs> Go ahead. Say, tell me one more time to make Christ master of my life. No, I'll, I'll jump ahead to what maybe some of you were thinking. This is, this is hard. Nothing in our world supports this. Nothing promotes self-surrender, which is why when we're fully able to surrender ourselves to God, we discover something, a new kind of freedom. So now we get to decide what we do with Ephesians, what we do with a calling to self-surrender. I would like to invite you to look at your own world. Each of us can only see from our own perspective. So look at your own world. Look at what you see. Think about it. Think about your own life. How you spend your time. 
how you spend your money. What occupies your mind most of the time. Even though this passage is communal, and we are all in this together, we can make our response personal. What is freedom like for you? What stands in the way of your own freedom? What in your life most reflects your complete surrender to God? What, when you think about your world, brings to your mind, I have joined with God. I have surrendered. I have acknowledged God's choice of me. Maybe the most difficult question is, what do I need to change to really find that freedom in Christ? Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're at a place in the journey where where we can take that and we can try to live it out. What do I need to change? Well, I hate to leave you hanging if you're hoping for an answer, but that's a conversation for you and God to have. Amen.